Good afternoon, and thank you to everyone for being here today. I am joined by Chief Bryant, uh, Lieutenant Malecki, and many other, other, other senior members of the Atlanta Police Department and um, investigators. There are a lot of people in the room today, um, and so I'll allow Chief Bryant to recognize them as appropriate and, and bring them up to speak as appropriate. Also joining us, our Chief Operating Officer, John Keene, and our Chief of Staff, Carmen Chubb. Uh, difficult is not a strong enough word to describe what 2020 has been like for our city and for our country. Far too many of our children have been victims of gun violence, and countless families have mourned the loss of loved ones this year. Mourning not just those lost to COVID-19, but to the senseless violence that we are seeing across our city and across our state and across our country. Never before have we faced a year like 2020, uh, coming together with the social justice movement in the midst of a pandemic, while also navigating uh, the challenges of our national leadership. People are struggling to make ends meet. People are sick. They're watching their family members die. People are depressed. They are anxious. And they are angry. And the weight of, of all of these issues are pouring out into our streets. I do not believe in excuses, as I learned very long ago, that excuses are tools of the incompetent. But I will give you the facts. I am on a text thread, several text threads, with mayors across this country. One thread has 18 mayors from the largest cities in America. And we are discussing, on almost a daily basis, the spike in violent crime that we are seeing in our cities. And also, we are sharing best practices and looking for ways that we can address this issue. Even one mayor has shared with me that he has a Stop the Bleed campaign going on in his city, that he's training his community members on how to stop the bleed from gunshot victims um, while they await the arrival of paramedics. This is not an excuse. This is a fact. I've spoken directly with President-elect Biden on more than one occasion about the mental and behavioral health impact that the last year is having on our communities and the need that we all have for national leadership to help us address this issue. Many of you all have heard me say this, and I'll say it again. This is a city that my family has called home for the past 100 years. And God willing, it will be at least 100 more. It's the city that I am raising my four children in. I know the pain of losing a loved one to senseless gun violence. This is personal for me. As mayor of Atlanta, I will continue to do what I have done every single day of my term. And with the partnership and leadership of the Atlanta Police Department, what they do 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we will continue to make our city a better place. And lastly, despite what at times may seem to be insurmountable odds, obstacles, and challenges too great to overcome. I will say that this to the people of Atlanta. We are still standing. We will not give up. We will not cower in a corner. We will not surrender our city to people who care nothing about the lives of the children and the families that call our city's home, call our city home. So with that, I am going to call up Interim Police Chief Rodney Bryant, who will share more information on the senseless murder 
of seven-year-old Kennedy. Um, there will also be other members, including Lieutenant Malecki of APD, who will provide additional updates. And then I will come back to the podium and share with you uh, steps that some have been shared publicly, some have been not, uh, steps taken by our administration to continue to address the spike in crime that we are seeing across our city. And then we will open up for questions. Chief Brian. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm here today to announce that we have identified a suspect in the shooting and obtain warrants for the individual we believe responsible for the shooting of young Kennedy Maxey. My heart goes out to her family and I give them my deepest condolences. As a father of daughters, I can only imagine what that family is going through. But more so, I can only, as a citizen of this city, as a child of this city, I can recall going to Lenox Mall as a child and going to different malls, shopping around the Christmas holidays and the excitement that I had as a child. This family did not have the opportunity to celebrate this uh, holiday season all the way through due to the actions of an individual who came into our city and violated the peace and sanctity that we have. But as I stated in our last press conference, that the city men and women of the Atlanta Police Department will not rest until we brought this individual to justice. We have identified him, and we will continue to work diligently to bring him into, back into the city of Atlanta to serve out his justice. We never rested. I want to address the narrative that the men and women of, Atlanta, of the Atlanta Police Department have some kind of way reserved in acting because we have not. We continue to forge forward. As the mayor said, we are still standing. We can't do it alone. We operate in a criminal justice system. And when most of that system is not operating, the Atlanta Police Department stays consistent. Throughout every day of this pandemic, the Atlanta Police Department responded to the call. Yes, we've had some of our issues. Our officers were hurt, but they still stood strong. They were still committed to this city. They still had the support of this administration, and they will forever have the support of the command staff of this police department. We will not rest. We will not allow people to come into our city and victimize our citizens. That's not who we are. But if you choose to come into Atlanta and violate the law, understand we will come after you. That is not who we are. We are one city. We come together in a time such as this. And so I thank the men, the, the witnesses. I thank everyone who participated in this. And to ensure that we bring this person to, to justice, the, the, the uh, reward still stands at $15,000 with the assistance of the Atlanta Police Foundation to help bring this person into our custody. I know that you have many uh, specifics and questions that you may have. That will be answered by Lieutenant Malecki of the Homicide Unit, who worked continuously to identify this person uh, and to be able to get those warrants to us this morning. Thanks. Uh, yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Lieutenant Malecki uh, with the Atlanta Police Department's Homicide Unit. Um, as Chief and the Mayor just stated, I'm happy to announce um, that we have issued arrest warrants in this case. Um, I'll give you a very brief overview of uh, the investigation, and then I will let you know the individual that we have warrants on and what those charges are. So as we know, on December 21st, um, as we spoke last time, uh, Kennedy Maxey was shot um, around the area of Peachtree Road and Lennox Road. Um, unfortunately, on December 26th, um, she died as a result of those injuries. So through just relentless investigative work, 
not only by the homicide unit, but by our many talented officers, detectives, and supervisors in the department. Uh, we all worked together, and we were able to identify the shooter in this case as 24-year-old Daquan Reed. So we have issued arrest warrants for Mr. Reed for felony murder, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, possession of a firearm during a crime, and reckless conduct. So although we still have a lot of work to do to apprehend Mr. Reed and then prepare this, this case for litigation, uh, you know, it's our hope that this will provide at least a sliver of relief to Kennedy's family. So I'll turn this back over to the mayor, and at the end, if you guys have specific questions uh, regarding the investigation, I'll be happy to address those. Okay. Thank you, Lieutenant and Chief Bryant. And what I shared um, as we were preparing to come out in my conversation with Kennedy's grandmother, the one thing that she asked for was that we bring the people responsible for this beautiful child's death to justice. So I am uh, personally grateful and on behalf of the city of Atlanta, grateful to the men and women of the Atlanta Police Department for allowing us to give at least that bit of comfort to Kennedy's family. I am going to give you an overview of what our uh, crime reduction plan is and, and will be. This is a work in progress. Um, I, just a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, held a press briefing specifically addressing crime in Atlanta. So some of this may be information that you all have heard before or have received um, through our press releases as we've issued several administrative and executive orders. Um, again, this is not the entirety of the plan. This will be a work in progress, but uh, for purposes of um, public information, I will go through a few highlights of that plan today. And again, thank you to Chief Brian and to our COO, John Keene, our Chief of Staff, Carmen Chubb, and others for giving so much attention um, and effort to making this plan possible. Uh, a couple of highlights here. Um, nuisance properties in the city as we are preparing for New Year's Eve. Uh, someone described the Hyatt Hotel to me as looking like Freaknik. For those of you who've been around Atlanta for any amount of time, you remember Freaknik. Uh, there are people traveling to Atlanta. Someone told me about an advertisement in Philadelphia for New Year's Eve parties in Atlanta. Again, a reminder, and this is not pointing blame at anyone. This is a statement of the facts. We are open. Our state is open. There are people traveling here from out of town and all that entails to party in our city. We will continue to focus on businesses that are violating our city codes including nightclubs that are staying open uh, beyond the hours in which they are entitled to stay open, including those who are violating the capacity limits of those businesses. Uh, this will be in conjunction with the Atlanta Police Department and also with the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department. The governor's order for capacity limits as it relates to COVID-19 requires us to provide notice and two citations to these owners. So to all of our nightclub and bar owners, you are being put on notice today. Um, to the extent that you've not received notice, I'm formally issuing notice. Um, and then it will be followed by, again, violation citations, which per the governor's order has to be two, uh, before we can impose fines and close businesses down. Uh, but we will be citing business owners for violations of capacity limits um, and also exceeding operating hours. We also will focus additional resources on our enforcement of our um, targeting our gangs and gun violence. 
Um, there, for whatever reason, there is a narrative that we have withdrawn from a gang task force in the city of Atlanta. That is absolutely not true. Uh, what we did do, uh, because our officers, APD officers, wear body-worn cam uh, cameras, uh, when they were assigned to some of our federal task force, they were not allowed to wear their cameras. We took those officers off of those task force. As a result of that, the federal government has now changed its policy, allowing all of the, not all of the officers, but many of the officers to wear cameras when they are assigned to these federal task force. So this very bold step that we took in Atlanta has now changed the federal policy uh, regarding body-worn cameras. So that is for the safety of the officers and also for the, uh, to help provide information on people uh, when people come in contact with these officers. We will also continue our federal partnership with the FBI through Operation Phoenix, which is a partnership to identify, investigate, and prosecute those deemed most dangerous in our city. Since that was announced, 12 violent offenders have already been apprehended. There will be targeted enforcement and investigation through the Violent Crime Reduction Team that's known as the Apex and Gun Assault Team. Um, they will continue to target violent offenders and investigate shooting incidents. To date, those teams have apprehended over 1,500 violent offenders and remove 356 guns from our street. Many have asked about us doing a gun buyback program. Um, as I've discussed it with our law department, there are some challenges with that program, but we, are, we will continue to explore all of our options. Uh, the establishment of the top 10 most wanted, this will continue to raise awareness of offenders in our city. Uh, since its creation about a month ago, already three people have been apprehended from that most wanted list. Uh, Chief or Sheriff Labatt, formerly Chief Labatt from our Corrections Department, was sworn in as Fulton County Sheriff today uh, through partnership with Fulton County. And thank you to Interim Chief Bryan and the work with um, Sheriff Labatt. Uh, we will be working together in Fulton County will put more um, sheriff's deputies on the streets at, at peak times to help us focus on crime suppression. Um, also, the expansion of the Operation Shield camera network. This is in conjunction with the Atlanta Police Department, which might I mention, uh, within the last month, we did a ribbon cutting for new at Promise Youth Center. And over at the Young Family YMCA, one of our challenged areas. Um, so hopefully by the end of the year, there will be three at Promise Youth Centers in the city. The one in Vine City, English Avenue has had a tremendous impact in creating relationships with our officers, with our communities, and we've seen a reduction of crime in that area. Also, neighborhood by neighborhood, community by community, uh, creating neighborhood safety planning, that we will work in partnership with our MPUs, with our community associations, um, and other entities to create safety plans that are specific to the challenges of a particular community. We've talked a lot about street racing. We've already seen a, deplo um, a reduction in street racing based on the efforts that have been made. We will continue to work on that. Also, um, as we talk about morale with our police department, uh, morale at the Atlanta Police Department, we know has suffered. We know that it is suffering across the country because being a police officer is a difficult job on a good day. And you add the challenges that we've seen over the past several months, and it makes it that much more challenging. Uh, we are working with the Atlanta Police Foundation along with um, other uh, entities across the city uh, to develop a new public safety training academy. If you've seen the one that the officers work out of now, it is in very poor condition. Also, um, we are working on a plan 
that will address recruiting and retention of our officers. There's been a lot of discussion on whether or not officers are leaving APD. This was a problem before we instituted the 30% pay increase for APD. Um, it continues to be a challenge. We've had some officers leave, some return. Again, this is not just an issue in Atlanta. We're seeing it across the country, but we will continue to place focus on that. Um, and also, we are continuing to work on our One Atlanta, One APD plan in conjunction with the national organization, PERF, uh, that's working with us to address many of our issues related to police, uh, improving our, our policies as it relates to policing in our communities. And before I open up for questions, John, did I miss anything? All right, those are just highlights, highlights. So again, you will um, in the coming days receive additional information, but I want to share that with you because I know it's been a point of discussion. And with that, um, I'll open up for any questions that you all may have. Are there any questions? All right. Anything else? Any other questions for me? For you, yes. Could you walk us through what you know now about the shooting? Sure. Um, so without getting into really specific investigative um, steps that we took, um, so we know that the suspect, uh, Daquan Reed, he was at Saks Fifth Avenue um, in the parking lot. At some point, um, he became engaged in an argument. That argument ended. Uh, Daquan left the parking lot in a vehicle and in a senseless act of rage, uh, discharged a firearm out that window. And one of those rounds struck the vehicle that Kennedy was riding in. So you still don't believe that they were intended targets? So we still have, you know, a lot of investigative things that we have to do to get all the answers. But at this point, uh, my belief continues to be that, no, I do not believe that they were uh, an intentional target of that shooting. How old is Daquan and where is he from? He's 24 from Virginia. Was anyone else shooting that you could tell us? So, again, we still have to, you know, dig a little deeper into this, but what we believe right now is we have the sole shooter uh, who killed Kennedy. And is he aware that you're looking for him? Uh, he probably will be now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, can, can you talk about some assistance that you were able to get from uh, a witness? Um, so we, we did have a witness who cooperated in our investigation. Again, without going into, you know, too many specific details of that cooperation, I will just say that that person was uh, extremely beneficial to us moving forward as fast as we did in this case. Give people a sense of, um, I think they know about the Buckhead plan and, and the plan the mayor just talked about that's forthcoming. But what can you say to people um, about these shootings at the malls. We've all been live there and people are always walking up to us and obviously asking us questions. What can you say about it now that we have more information on this one? So I think they're all independent events. Um, you know, this one is was for nothing. It was senseless. It shouldn't have happened. Um, it did. And when anything like this does happen, you know, I can assure you that, that my unit will not stop working. We will work around the clock until we get, you know, those individuals who are responsible. Do you have some video that you were able to uh, not at this time, no. Are you working with outside agencies, I guess, trying to bring in there? So, again, we, uh, we secured this arrest warrant early this morning. It was after midnight. So that is something that is in the works, and we will coordinate uh, with all of our law enforcement partners to get this individual in custody just as soon as we can. The mayor spoke a little bit about um, the grandmother and her wishes, and I imagine the whole family um, wishes that. Can you talk to us about the family's um, state of mind since, you know, we've, at least we've been giving them. I mean, I, they're in a state of mind that anyone would expect them to be in. You know, they lost a seven-year-old baby. So you can imagine that it's, it's going to continue to be tough for them. So I think anything we can do to provide just an ounce of relief, then we're going to do it. So in terms of Mr. Reed, uh, he, uh, let's say, maybe had some local affiliation. Address. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to get some sense of 
Um, no. Now, again, we're still investigating what his business was in Atlanta. Uh, we have not found anything that links him to being a resident of our city, and we do believe he resides out of state. My other question was just going to be, does sure. he have any family here? But he again, still, uh, we're still trying to work that up, and we'll continue to work that with our fugitive unit and all of our federal partners to get him in custody. Is there a picture of him? So we, we will provide that to you guys. I believe our public affairs unit will be emailing that out to anyone who's interested. Any idea what kind of criminal history? Uh, he is a convicted felon out of Virginia, and he did have multiple cycles. Um, he was convicted on a forgery charge. That's what made him a convicted felon. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, you asked a question about why we are seeing so much activity at the malls. Uh, I, I wanted to be clear that during the pandemic, one of the unique things is there's no other areas to socialize. People find themselves, there's no football games to go to. There's no high school football games to go to. There's n restaurants are minimized in the number of people that they can see. So uh, one of the things that I continue to do uh, is to go out to the malls to see exactly how our police presence and the security presence are at the mall. What I tend to find is people generally socialize in these areas. And that's a problem. Uh, and that's something that we have to learn to address at, at the magnitude that people are just socializing and not shopping the way that they traditionally will do. Uh, but as uh, to, to address it in the short term is for us to have add, added resources. We're utilizing every technology that we have, uh, increasing the resources in that space, working with Simon Properties and the security to make sure that people continue to be safe. Uh, but again, the best response that we can have, the best assistance that we can have, is everybody working together to address public safety. If they see something that is unusual, that they get, get in touch with security or police so that we can re immediately respond to whatever may be occurring. That, uh, I think, will help address some of the issues that we're seeing while people continue to just socialize in these, in these spaces. Interesting turnover in the department this year. Talk about how you've been able to Absolutely. Listen, uh, make no mistake about it. The mayor stated it earlier that uh, law enforcement as a whole saw a significant, we took a significant hit, uh, and people left this, this profession. People left our organization. So one of the things that we have to do is strengthen our partnerships uh, and, and strengthen our relationships with the community so that public safety as a whole is responsible to address what's happening in, the, in these areas. Uh, at, within the, the uniqueness of the city of Atlanta Police Department is we are the one that we are the largest police department in this state, and we can pull from additional resources, uh, and 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 it slows down some of our administrative processes. But we can now put those people on the street to help do what they to, uh, what they were hired on to do, and that's be police officers and provide, provide safety to the citizens that we serve. There was one question that I meant to ask. Maybe you can answer. Was there one shot fired? Are you able to? Talk about that. There were, there were, you want to talk about it, LT? Sure. There were, uh, there were approximately three, three shots fired, we believe, at this point, but only one of those shots um, struck Kennedy's vehicle. And struck anything? Or anything? Correct. Also, um, what was shared, um, we have some information, and I hope I'm relaying this accurately, that this is not the first time that this young man has been detained in our area. Not sure if it's APD that's previously detained him, uh, but he's not a stranger to law enforcement. And you asked about the family's state of mind, and far be it for me to speak for the family, but in my conversation with Kennedy's mother on Christmas Eve, she couldn't stop crying. And she said repeatedly her baby didn't deserve that. And in my conversations with her grandmother, the morning after she passed, um, they didn't even know a funeral home to call. She said her family has been in Atlanta over 20 years. They've never had to bury anyone. So this is her granddaughter who's the oldest of her grandchildren. So the state of mind is 
one that we couldn't possibly imagine. That you are out with your seven-year-old. The excitement of the holidays. You leave home to go to the mall and you find yourself at a hospital at Christmas. And this is, uh, you know, in talking with the major from the zone, and I think everybody is in agreement. This is hard. This is another child in our city, not the first child. This is another child. And I had a conversation with the mother of the the boy who was out selling water, not not bothering anybody, trying to save up some money. I mean, this is these are children. And it, it's hard and it hurts and it is, it is unacceptable. And I don't think there's a person in this room, um, if there is anything that any of us could have done differently to have us not be here and not have that family trying to figure out how to bury a seven-year-old. If you could tell me something we could do differently today and tomorrow, because we were here with Sequoia Turner's family, and we're back here again. So I, I, I want to be clear. I know what I am responsible for in this city, and I take it very seriously, and I take it personally. And I said it when we were here this summer, and I'll say it again. You know, the, if, if there's something that we're not doing, if there's something we haven't enacted, if there's something we need to do better, I, my ego is small enough to ask you to tell me what we can and should do differently because I want us to do it differently because I don't like standing here having this conversation with you all about this. I don't like it. I don't want to have to do it. I don't think anybody in this room wants to be here to talk about this. So what I do know is APD is, is doing what they can. I do know that if there are resources that they don't have, we'll move mountains to make sure they have what they need. We're, we are working to address the systemic issues that are leading us to this point. It's not going to be an easy fix. But if there's something that we can do differently, if you know what it is, let us know. And I promise you, if it will make a difference and it will stop us from having to be here again, we'll do it. Any other questions? All right, thank you.